Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jeff Tate. We're, gonna, we're going to talk today about improving power, performance, and cost when embedding embedded FPGAs into SOCs. Jeff, when we think about FPGAs, typically we think about standalone discrete chips. These are now being integrated into SOCs today. What's changed? What's driving that? And what has to be done in order to improve on that? Well, thank you, Ed. Um, yes, we do have customers now integrating FPGAs into their SOCs, and successfully. Uh, the largest customer S FPGA being integrated right now is 240,000 lookup tables. Uh, we have customers doing speeds of over 500 megahertz, worst case conditions, and we expect the performance and the number of LUTs to continue to increase. So how do we improve upon that? Because think, typically when you think about FPGAs, these are typically power-hungry types of chips, right, compared to some of the other ones. Uh, yes, and integrating FPGA gets rid of a lot of the power, but we can do even better with what we'll talk about today. Okay, let's dig into this. Great, let's do it. Jeff, what are we looking at? Well, we have a lot of customers who have this situation. They're typically systems companies. They've got a board, they've got the chip of their own, and they have an FPGA. And they like the FPGA because it gives them flexibility for changing standards or algorithms, customer needs. But what they want to do is, is get, have the cake and eat it too. They want to lower the cost, lower the size, lower the power, but keep the flexibility and the adaptability. And that adaptability and flexibility is absolutely critical these days because chips are lasting longer and they're also, you're dealing with algorithms that are constantly changing, right? Yes, things like 5G, the standards aren't going to be settled by the time they start working on 6G. So if they hardwire everything, they have a danger of not being able to keep up with changing standards. So how exactly do you integrate an FPGA? What, has, what do you have to think about if you're a design engineer looking at this going, okay, what are we trying to do? Right. So let's talk first about how people are doing it today, and then I want to talk about how we can do even better in future designs. So what's in this FPGA? If you, if you look at this FPGA and we blow it up a bit, uh, the FPGA consists of a digital core in the middle. It's about two-thirds of the chip, and around the outside are all the fives. These are the things talking to the rest of the world, like DDR, PCIe, CERDES, JSD, all sorts of interfaces. This is where most of the power gets burned. 80% of the power is probably burned in the FIs, only 20% in the digital logic. So the obvious thing is integrate the FPGA, take the digital portion and put it inside your SOC. But you don't have to put all of the digital portion in when we work with customers, what we see in almost all cases is that you know, there's data coming in from DDR, there's data coming in from PCIe, for example, and there's, there's, there's programmable logic that's involved in busing that data into the portion of the core that actually changes. So you can hardwire all of the stuff that's now busing inside the FPGA, and that leaves you with the digital portion of the FPGA that actually gets reprogrammed. That's what you take and integrate into your SOC. We have customers doing this today, over 500 megahertz, hundreds of thousands of lookup tables. It's very feasible, and you cut power by 5 to 10x, and you cut cost by 5 to 10x. But people ask us, how can we do even better? So how can you do better? So what we can do is we can look at what's inside this programmable area, and what could we do to make things even smaller? So I want to use an example. What are we looking at? Well, this is a very trivial example. You know, our, our customers, when they're doing hundreds of thousands of lookup tables, aren't doing as something as simple as this. But simple examples help illustrate a point. So suppose a customer is using an FPGA to do a programmable FIR filter. An FIR filter you know, has a certain number of taps. Uh, more taps is better, but it leads to greater latency. So in this case, the customer might want to have a programmable FIR filter where they can, in some cases, go through all of the taps, getting more accuracy, but in other cases, selectively choose to go through a subset of the taps, less accuracy but lower latency. And perhaps in different use cases when they're using their FPGA, this is desirable. So you can integrate the whole thing as is, but 
what I want to do is should use this as an example to show how you can integrate the FPGA in a smarter way where you harden more of it and only keep an FPGA the part that really needs to be reprogrammable. What are we looking at now? This is an FIR filter? We're looking at uh, an FIR filter of a certain kind. It's got this an indeterminate number of stages and this maps very easily onto FPGA hardware. These are the multiply accumulator blocks inside an FPGA and you chain them together. The longer the chain, the longer the filter. Typically, that's not an easy thing to do though, right? You run into performance issues as you go forward. That, that's correct. In an FPGA, ours or other people's, it's possible because we place these multiply accumulators close together, close together, that sometimes you can pipeline from one Mac to another Mac directly and you achieve higher performance. But eventually in any FPGA, you're going to get to the end of the ability to pipeline and you have to go through the interconnect fabric and this is where things slow down in every FPGA. That's part of the, the hard part of programming in FPGA, right? Is when you're working with that interconnect fabric. Well, the interconnect fabric is critical to have the flexibility, but when, when you exceed, as you can see here, there's 28 nanometers, here's 16 nanometers. When you're doing short filters, you can run really fast, near a gigahertz, and these are worst case numbers. But when you have to go through the interconnect fabric, which longer filters will eventually require in any FPGA, your performance drops down because you're limited by the interconnect fabric. So what if you're integrating this into an SOC? You don't have to do everything in FPGA. You can hardwire the Mac portion of this design. So basically what you're doing here, though, is you're taking this and looking at this from a system perspective being the SOC, right? As opposed to this is just a chip that's going to be embedded in here. Correct. Our customers are SOC designers and systems designers. So they today use the FPGA and they can't change it. But when they integrate it, they can think through the architecture. The, the simple, easy way is just to suck in hundreds of thousands of lookup tables. But if they want, they can start looking and, and bringing an FPGA in a more careful way where they get even better results than if they just suck in all of the FPGA that they have now. When you think about an EFPGA, we've been talking about this for years now. Is this a new approach to this? Is this a better way of doing it? Well, in the past, nobody was able to integrate FPGA. Um, but what we will talk about here is what I believe people will do in the future because everyone is constantly looking to get the most performance, but keep the flexibility they need to be able to adapt. A lot of this is going into AI chips. Um, you think about EFPGAs are being used for things like controlling, they're used for uh, basically what the operating system used to do. It's now coming down into a hardware level where it runs much more efficiently than it did in the past. What's happening here with AI? Well, it's not just AI with signal processing as well, or a range of applications. What we're tell, telling customers is, hey, we can integrate all of the FPGA you're using today. And that will be a lot cheaper and a lot lower power. But if you want to do even better, think about something like this. And this is what we did when we were designing our own AI product, is we realized that in AI, just like in a signal processing example, there are billions and trillions of multiply accumulate operations. So rather than have individual Macs with a lot of overhead circuitry for the programmable interconnect, we could consolidate and hardwire the Macs into what we call here one-dimensional tensor processors. These are 64 integer Macs with, with a matrix of weights, which could also be used for the DSP example that we showed earlier. But there's 16 of them, and these 16 can be connected programmably in different ways to implement the kind of programmable fur filter that that customer had on the example before. So now what we've done is we've hardened most of the data path. The area that this takes is way less than the area it would take to have the max in an FPGA. And the portion that's FPGA is the control state machines. So just the portion that you need to control the execution of this is a, now an FPGA. And the end result is that compared to just implementing this all in FPGA, we get much less area, but we also get higher performance, 
With FPGA, the longer the interconnects, the slower everything goes. So if you have a control block and it has to go across a big FPGA, it's not going to run as fast as a control block that's just controlling something very close by. So you get less area, you keep all the flexibility, and you boost your performance. So whatever the customer is doing in an FPGA, if they want to invest the effort, they can get even better results by breaking down their FPGA and hardening the data path, having programmable interconnects, and then keeping the control in FPGA. And because this is an FPGA, you're basically running with whatever process that, that chip was developed at, right? So if it's seven nanometers, it's a seven nanometer FPGA. Right, and that's part of why we started thinking about this. Well, we started doing this for our own reasons, but we've been talking to customers recently who are using very fast FPGAs, but their own SOCs are not in FinFET. They're planar process SOCs. So they're kind of like, well, I can't integrate the FPGA because it's seven nanometers and I'm on 28 nanometers. But as I showed you, when you, when you keep things tight and controlled, you can run pretty fast in FPGA even at 28 nanometers. So a customer can, in many cases, if they follow this approach, suck in their much more expensive, more advanced process node FPGA into an older process node that's cheaper but get the performance that they're getting in the FPGA. That's a huge benefit. Do you potentially use more than one FPGA in an SOC? So these are becoming increasingly heterogeneous. We need control type of uh, logic all the way through this. Does this now suffice for the entire SOC or do you need more? Um, you know, I suspect when people started integrating processors into chips, there was one. We deal with a lot of customers and they have processors all over the place. There's big processors here, there's medium processors there, there's little processors here and the same thing is happening with FPGA. Our customers who have been working with us the longest move, move from the initial one giant block to spreading the FPGA around the chip. And so if you think about an uh, advanced package, you may actually have FPGAs on different chips or chiplets within that package too, right? Well, sure, that's a no, whole other topic, chiplets. But yes, FPGA is going to be on all sorts of SOCs in the future. Jeff Tate, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Well, thank you, Ed. Appreciate it.